What's up, sales bros? Little preface on this podcast. It was the first in-person one, and we filmed with a camera and mic that, or a camera and mics that we realized just shut off in the middle of the pod like two times. So if you're wondering why we're holding mics the whole time and the audio is not that good, it's because this is actually recorded on my iPhone. I had set it as a backup, didn't think we'd really need it, just figured maybe some B-roll or something, and it's the only one that we have that recorded the whole conversation. So you can still hear what we're saying. It's not the best audio, but it's one of my favorite episodes that I've recorded so far, so hopefully you guys like it as well. Let's get into it. Here we are. <laughs> In-person <laughs> podcast. Are we on my podcast? We're on your podcast. All right. Yeah. Sales Bro Pod. Um, it's pro- Dude, this might be like 29, 30, somewhere in there. I'd have to look at the numbers. Your 2,930th podcast episode? No, no, no. Like 29 or 30. Okay. Yeah. If I was if I was on 2930, <laughs> I would know how to do the camera setup yeah. a little bit better. Um, but yeah, so we just spent the last like 30 minutes trying to figure out how to film mm-hmm. with this million dollar view. Didn't work. Um, but this time around, we're with Griffin. Uh, Griffin runs Build Your Practice. Mm-hmm. It is a, I don't want to butcher this, coaching, consulting business for Mental health therapist. Mental health yeah. therapist. It's, yeah. It's like an info agency model. So we do digital marketing build outs and coaching, and then it's the business models of consulting. Yeah. Kind of many different pools we're in. Yeah. And the way we know each other, I feel like I keep talking to the camera, <laughs> but the way we know each other, I moved to Austin from San Antonio. You hit me up. You're like, hey, we have this little thing that we do. A couple guys get together. And, um, I don't know, I just figured audience should get to know like kind mm-hmm. of how, how we even ended up here. But yeah, I moved to Austin, didn't know anybody except like one or two people. And then Griffin hit me up and um, now I know more than one or two people. Yeah. So it's been cool. And then also we're kind of like in similar spaces and um, the other people that you've introduced me to and what's branched off of that, a lot of people are doing what we do here. So it's yeah. cool, Austin's a cool place to be. And um, we'll talk about it more. I guess we'll go back into your origin story a little bit. Um, but you lived in San Antonio for a bit. Great place. Yeah. Born and raised yeah. there. Yeah, pretty good place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. You might you might be biased. You've been to like a few other places. But yeah, um, yeah man. So taking it back, today you're running Build Your Practice. Seven figure run rate? Yeah. Close to it, yeah. yeah. I mean, between 800 to a million this year, we'll see how much we pump up sales in the sure. last couple of months. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure it'll. I'm sure we'll get there. Um, but you didn't start there, and from what I understand, it's been you know a while in the making. It's been a grind, mm-hmm. um, just as a lot of this stuff seems to be. It's not like some overnight SMMA get rich quick deal. Um, taking it back, man. Like to the to the earlier days. Let's talk like you know, middle school, high school, Griffin, was he, was he always like, you always had this like entrepreneurial vision, like, or where did that come no, from? Um, I tell this story a lot, but uh, for the first 23, 22 years of my life, all I wanted to be was a professional soccer player. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot, like I, I say a lot, I say in my own content, like I think it's extremely similar going to try and be a professional athlete versus like trying to make this an entrepreneur. Um, but I did not really have much in the way of like entrepreneurship until I was like 22 years old and that's still kind of tied into athletics. My dad was an entrepreneur. My grandpa was an entrepreneur. So I think there's stuff in the bloodline. I, I do think there's, you know, creativity that gets passed down, uh, which is important, but yeah, from age 13 till 22, it was just all trying to make it as a professional soccer player. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, when it comes to just taking accountability for your results and pushing yourself and showing up and learning discipline, like the athlete to entrepreneur pipeline is like, uh, I, I know that when I have kids, I really want to put them into sports for that reason, just so that they can learn how to grow up and be accountable and all that yeah. stuff. And just learn how to get kicked in the face, honestly. I feel like it's yeah. the most important thing is like, you just, you just get beat down so many times that like you develop resilience yeah. and I think that's most of the journey. Yeah. Pressure creates diamonds, man. <laughs> that's what they said. Um, so yeah, so you played, 
soccer, you were looking to go pro. I actually recently watched your the the video on your YouTube. A the, highlight video? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw the high, I didn't watch the highlight video, but oh, I saw okay. the like the story video. Yeah. And so yeah, that was kind of top of mind. Um, why, like, you're from Vegas, right? Yeah. You lived there for, like, until college years, or, like, how long? Yeah, from, there? like, till the age of 18, and then moved, went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for a year. Crazy story there, trying to make the team. Ended up transferring, went to San Antonio University of Incarnate Word. Let's go. There for a year and a half. Then Philadelphia for two years to finish out a graduate degree. Masters of Psychology, and then uh, captain the Division One team at that point. I did like summers in San Diego, so I've kind of been all these different places, and then I moved to Austin. Dude, that's yeah. a lot. Do you like moving around like that? No, it's terrible, dude. It was like it was all because I had to, right? Like um, I only ever moved because I wanted to change teams to try and like level myself up to be yeah. a pro soccer player. But like every time you completely move locations, you kind of lose all your friends from the last location, you have to rebuild all your yeah. relationships from scratch, which can be cool. Um, but like the fourth time you do it, you know, it's like you start to, it's just like, it becomes harder to like, want to just be completely yeah. going. You You're know, like, like, what's the point? I'm just going to move again. going to move again anyway. And like, that was like a, you know, some trauma I had to kind of get past and like, try and stay in the same place for a longer period of time. Yeah. Well now, like you being here in Austin, you're like, I imagine because you're not pursuing like professional soccer anymore, you kind of have more say over like, oh, this well, place is nice. Right. Let me stay here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you do you plan on staying here? Or do you plan on leaving? Something? I mean, I, I just resigned my lease for like I think this is like the fourth year, so mm. just kind of keep staying as long as it's cool and I keep meeting cool people. Yeah. But yeah, I mean that was the case in soccer where it's like you can just get let go of a team and you find a new one. And it's like every year for 10 years, you know, you yeah. guys be constantly moving. So I, I like it. This place is growing. There's great people. I mean, yeah. that's why I put together that group is like, there's a lot of good connections people make here. Yeah. Dude, this, I love this city, man. Like, I mean, there's things that aren't perfect by all means is every place is things that are not perfect, but like the opportunity, people you can meet, um, the weather is brutal right now <laughs> but it's worth it dude like you got you got you kind of have seasons not really but you got the water you got like tons of stuff to do like you'll never run out of stuff to do um you will never run out of places to eat it's like it's a good place to be yeah yeah no, i love austin so taking it back to um just you like rising through the ranks trying to go pro with soccer Towards the end of that, or I guess like when did you start picking up the like what you're doing now or like the online stuff? Was it like while you were doing soccer or like was it afterwards? It was while I was doing soccer. I I always loved YouTube and I would consume hours of YouTube every day. Um, for whatever reason, I, I like I looked at the student loan debt I was going to graduate college with and like looked at what the salary of like a Division two soccer player was going to be, and I was like oh shit, like, I, I have to learn how to make money. And so I remember I, just, I went through like winter break my last year in college and like sold a bunch of like old electronics I had at home, like like iPhones and Game Boys and stuff on eBay. And I basically went through this YouTube rabbit hole of like how to sell stuff on eBay. And I saw people that were like going into stores and like buying socks and reselling it on eBay and they made a hundred K a year. And it was called like, you know, retail arbitrage. And then I got recommended new videos, which was like, rather than going into the store, I go on eBay and I buy something and I sell it on Amazon and it's, it's arbitrage. And I was like, Oh my God, this guy can make like a hundred thousand a year. And then I found another guy, Gabriel St. Germain as a drop shipper. Yeah. And he was like, I just made $200,000 and made a million dollars in sales at 21 and here's how I did it. And just walked through his whole strategy. And I was like, that's the thing. Cause I can do it online. Whenever I'm traveling to all these different places, I'll always have this skill set. Yeah. And I, I, don't know, I just got hooked um, and just started going down the rabbit hole. Like, how do I pick a product and start selling it online? Dude, dropshipping was the sexiest business for like, I think that sparked entrepreneurship, not sparked it, but like ignited entrepreneurship in so many people because like I had the same experience. Because you said Gabriel St. Germain, I think we've talked about how like he was the dude. 
I, I didn't find him first, but I found him like not shortly after, or not too long after. Um, what was that like 2016, 2017? I found him 2018. Okay. He was like the best, you know? Yeah. He was like so humble and then yeah, yeah. He, um, he just like disappeared, right? Yeah, he like went off the grid. I mean, he obviously knew how to make money. Yeah. He was like, yeah. And like, I just remember he sold a course. He, he released his YouTube video one day. And that kind of inspired me kind of to, to launch into visual practice. He made $400,000 in a day selling this course. Sure. And then he like disappeared a couple months later. He's like, yeah, actually. Or it was like a year later or something. He's like, I don't really want to keep running courses and stuff. But he's doing other projects is what his website says. Like to, to this day or at that time? I'm, I wonder what he's up to. Uh, okay, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure he's doing something. Yeah. He was in real estate or something where he probably pivoted out of the online space. Yeah, dude. Yeah, that guy was, was something. And for me, it was that guy, you know, like Nate Schmidt. I don't think so. He, he's big on like Twitter. And so the whole money Twitter thing, um, he's still on there, but I think, you know, similar, made, you know, made some money and like realized, hey, I can, I can continue doing this without social media or whatever, focus on this. And then I tried it. I like sold some things. I don't even know if I was profitable. It just, it didn't really work. Um, or I couldn't make it work. Now saying it didn't work. What was your experience like, like starting up stores and, and running them and stuff? I probably did it for like six to eight months. It was first, like at first it was really hard to like do work. Cause I was still in graduate school and playing soccer and pursuing professional. It was really hard to like go on the social media and like start posting and learning ads and all these things. Um, I, I kind of pivoted to a couple of different stores, but I eventually focused on like a portable blender. If you've ever seen Blendjet, I mean, they're probably like a 30 million a year company now, but like they were just getting started, but they had full like good team. Yeah. And so I was trying to compete with them and I, I was able to like build up sales. I, I got to like a couple hundred bucks a month um, through Facebook ads, through like, influencer marketing like I kind of figured out quite a few things mm -hmm. um, but I think basically there was an opportunity to switch into Bojo practice and I was like not really passionate about like selling blenders on, online yeah. it was like it was like really hard to get my self behind like I gotta sell a million of these things yeah how did that opportunity present itself with like you said you had the chance to go on to build your practice we I was just sitting on an airplane this 21 year old uh Southwest Airlines flight, and I, I sit at the back of this airplane going from Philadelphia to Denver, and it's this young girl sits down next to me, and then this this boisterous woman comes down, and the young girl gets up because the woman's with another friend, if that makes sense. She sits down next to me with her friend, and they start talking about psychology and private practice and nursing and the field of mental health. It's like a really passionate conversation. So I talk her on the shoulder. And I was like, oh, can I ask you some questions? Because I was getting a master's in psychology and was like interested in like, how do you make money doing like therapy? That's like a crazy thing. But like, you know, like people actually make money doing this. They can make six figures a year doing that. She's like, yes. And she's like walking through the whole thing. And she, after like three hours of talking to her, she's like, I don't know if you want to do anything about this, but like nobody's teaching this. And then and somebody needs to do something about this and like teach these counselors how to do business education. I was like, should we do that? Um, and I have this idea from Gabriel St. Germain about like launching a course yeah. and how we can teach them the business skills. And then from there, for a while, I was like, I'll just do both businesses, but I pretty quickly shut down. The, I could not play soccer, yeah. finish out college and do two businesses. Yeah, why, why did you pick psychology? Um, I did philosophy undergrad. I've always been interested in like, how do you perform at the highest level? And I had to get a master's because I was graduating early, so I didn't want to do philosophy. So psychology was the next natural answer, which was how do the top performers, how do they organize their brains that they can do that? Yeah. Um, and so it was really like performance psychology, sports psychology was kind of the, the lens through which I was looking at it. Most people that I know that like went into psychology, they didn't do it for that reason. They're like, oh, you know what? It's not saying they did it for the wrong reasons, but like they wanted to help people or they wanted to figure people out. But like, I've never met anyone who was like, I want to know why or how these people perform at the highest levels. And I think that alludes to what you're doing now, like really yeah. well. So, so that's funny. So you get on this flight from Philly to Denver, 
talks to this lady for like three hours. She basically gives you the blueprint on like how to scale a practice or what? Yeah, yeah. Well, she just walked me through like, yeah, all the different pieces of business education in the system and ACE scores, which is like adverse childhood experience, and like the correlation between mental health outcomes and physical outcomes in the hospital systems and like big systems level overview. And I was just like, I'm starting business around doing this. Um, and yeah, like to start, it wasn't like all the marketing, which is what it has kind of come is like, how do you actually get clients in the practice? It's like the biggest piece, but it was like, what's revenue, what's expenses, what's profit? Like very basic stuff is what we're thinking about teaching mm. to, uh, to counselors. So what did build your practice 1.0 look like? Dude, 1.0, I tried to model the sales page from Gabriel St. Germain, but it was, <laughs> it was like, um, dude, it took me like hours, like days to like try and record out videos, it took months to like put it all together. But it's like, I'm going to teach you what revenue is, you know, and like the definition of revenue and then like expenses and profit and like how marketing works and like just very business foundations, maybe like three hours of content, three to six hours. Um, and it was just a course and it was a hundred bucks when I first started. Mm. Um, and I thought it was like so much money because the margins on a portable blender are like $5 or $10. Yeah. I was like, I can make 10 times the margin for selling air. It yeah. was like incredible. Dude, sometimes I get jaded to the fact that like what you and I are into now, like it is pretty high profit margins. And I look at, like I used to rewind to like 2017, 2018. I used to see these e-com guys and they're doing like $10,000 a month. I'm like, holy shit, they're doing $10,000 a month. And now like, fast forward now, I kind of understand like, okay, e-com, it's not all profit, like Marketing nothing close to it. Advertising. It's like that dude, that dude was probably living like not well off of 10,000 of revenue a month, you know? Whereas, you know, online education, consulting, like B2B services, stuff yeah. like that, it's like, it's just so much better, dude. Yeah, it's it's life is about margin. It's not just about revenue. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. But like, as a as a young dude, you don't you don't even think about that, dude. You're like, holy shit, he made he made ten k a month online. Like, I live with my parents, like I want to make ten k a month online. So yeah. that's funny. And and I did something similar. You said you started at hundred bucks. It was like three to six hours video content. Like when I started my community, I started subscriptions nine dollars a month, and I launched it and I had people buy. And I was like, "Dude, I'm making like fifty dollars MRR right now. Like, Dude, if I just keep sh- going, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah." I was like, yeah. "Holy, like, dude, I just figured, I just figured money out. Like, this is it." Um, but yeah, there's definitely evolution on both sides of that. So you get, did you like with that? Was there like life calls and stuff, or was it like solely info product? Like, yeah, like it, it pretty much was like live calls from the beginning, but it was like you have the course, we'll do a group call. I think I saw other people did that, was following Sam Ovens and stuff, and be like one group call plus the live things. And I thought that was valuable to people, yeah. And yeah, like 100 bucks, and then yeah. just like so many small price releases along the way. Was it like Facebook, you set it up in like Facebook group and a- Facebook group, Zoom calls, Kajabi for the course. Yeah. And this was where on the timeline? Like what year? 2020. 2020. Okay. So yeah, I, I graduated in December 2019. It was like, okay, I'm gonna go. I went on a professional trial for a couple of months, got a trial with the Division Two team. I got cut and I was like, I'm not, this is, this is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> this is a game I don't wanna play. Decided to go all in like February 2020. Made the first sale like March 12th for 100 bucks, and then March 14th was like COVID, and all the news came out and things kind of got shut down. But that was kind of where I yeah. built this whole thing. Did you ever like clearly number one priority was like I want to go pro, play soccer, and then you know you went on to go uh, create build your practice. But did you ever um, did you ever want to go like? practice psychology or like was that ever in the cards i don't know if that's like the right not really I, I i had a um kind of like a mentor in graduate school who was down the performance psychology track so he got um he got a job like working for an mlb team you can be like two hundred thousand a year as like a sports psychologist working mm-hmm. with professional athletes but I, I wanted to be the athlete i didn't want to be the like psychologist yeah. 
Um, so I had interest and I was always, I, you know, I thought, okay, I'll own the sports team and hire a psychologist and <laughs> know how that works, but I don't want to be, I never really saw myself doing the, the work, but like I wanted to like understand what it was so I could use it if I wanted to, but not that that was the only job that I had. That makes sense. Yeah. So like in a, in a sense was like you going into psychology and you were going to like learn how these people perform at the highest level. Was that so that you could, like at that time, did you have that vision? Yeah, it was like, so that I could be the professional soccer player. Like I want to learn the skills so that I can apply them to myself. Dude, that's smart. That's smart. Why didn't you do like, oh, in case, well, I don't know, it seems like you made the right choice, but like, oh, like, you know, I'm going to go all in on soccer, but if it doesn't work, like me and dude, I was like, I just want something that I would have the fail safe and, uh, that's why I went into like construction science and management because I always kind of knew, I always want to get in real estate. I always want to do my own thing, mm -hmm. but it was like worst case scenario, dude, I know I can plug in, make 60 K a year here, like no masters, no nothing. Did you ever like plan B? No, no plan B. You're no just plan like, B. that's the way to do it too. Dude. Like if I could have, maybe, I don't know. Like <laughs> looking back, I just didn't have any context. I didn't yeah. have any understanding of like how much life actually costs. So like I got an undergrad degree in philosophy and I think I thought like I'll just start a business, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. If soccer doesn't work, but I'm like, then soccer's gonna work. So it's like why yeah. even like obviously soccer's gonna work, you know? Um, but I, I always remember thinking like in college, I'm like, man, if I could just make like 30 grand a year, I'll be <laughs> fine. Because I remember my expense at the time was like four hundred dollars in rent, yeah, you know, four hundred dollars in food. I'm like, I'll, I'll have extra money left over, like I'll yeah. be fine. Uh, it took a while to figure out. Like once I got in the real world, it's like, okay, <laughs> I yeah. can't learn on the fly, you know? Dude. Yeah, especially living in a city like Austin, dude, costs a little bit more <laughs> to, Does, to yeah. enjoy it, right? Depends like where you want to live, right? Like there's some places cost more because it's better. <laughs> it's yeah. like you pay for quality. Yeah. So you said both your parents are entrepreneurs or like just entrepreneurs in the family? My my dad and then my grandpa. Okay. Um my grandpa started 15 businesses, my dad started like three. Cool, so they were probably more supportive of like your decision to not really have a plan B, like go all in, yeah. you're young, you can mess it up, you can try again, that's interesting. Yeah, my parents were super supportive of me doing all these crazy things, and moving different colleges and like going for professional soccer and yeah. studying philosophy, like, <laughs> you know, as supportive as they can be, to be like, no, like you'll figure it out. Yeah. When did you realize, like, man, the soccer thing, like, might be time to hang it up, at least, like, trying to pursue being a professional? I, like, I, like, pretty much never doubted it. I always, I had, like, some stuff around, like, I don't want to get CT, and, like, what does the career prospect actually look like if you move cities every single, every single year? But I, I was, like, I'm just going to figure it out. I'll go D2, and I'll just make it as a pro. Um... It was kind of until like I actually started to go on trial and be out of college uh, that I was like kind of seeing what it was like to be on trial at these places for a Division Two team in Lynchburg, Virginia or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I was just like, is this is this the life? You know. Um, yeah. But it started to get kind of clear to me like in January, like two months into trials, two three months into trials, and I was like, as I was kind of working on the business stuff and how exciting it was. Um, but the, like, there was like a moment of clarity, like on the day Kobe Bryant died, I had a friend who like dropped me off at a, a McDonald's and was waiting for another friend to pick me up for a pro soccer trial. And I remember seeing the news and like, there was this moment of clarity. It was like, I might be a division two soccer player. I could probably work my way up, like working really hard to get to a division one soccer player in the MLS, but I'll never have the impact being you know, like this kind of selfish journey of going to play pro soccer player that I could in entrepreneurship. And I was like, I just feel like it was like this, this kind of scale tilted and it was like, look at the potential here. And it was just like kind of clear from that day forward. And I was like, I'll keep following this through. And if I get on a team this year, great. But like, I believe that if I went into entrepreneurship, I wouldn't regret it. And that I would actually have a much longer career um, span to create something amazing. That's that's interesting, dude. That was a heavy day when Kobe died. Yeah, and I, I just saw like 
the outpouring of love from like everyone in the country was like he had had an impact beyond just playing basketball. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I was driving in my, I was delivering Amazon packages when that happened, still in college. And yeah, it, it was definitely a good like point of reflection on a lot of things. I unfortunately I didn't come to, come to the idea that like oh I need to go all in on entrepreneurship when he died, but like <laughs> yeah, dude, that, that definitely put a lot of things into perspective. Um, and that was 2020, yeah. 2020, yeah. Do you think COVID and all that stuff played a, a negative or positive role on like the early stages of building your practice? You know, I think it played a negative role in my mindset because I was just like, geez, I just, you know, I'm, I just got my first sale and now the whole world shutting down and I, I have no, no understanding of like, you know, how to actually manage this. Um, so I think it just kind of, for the first couple of months, maybe lose a little bit of momentum, but I picked up pretty quickly and I think people shifted more towards online after that. And so I think long term it's probably, probably been better. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it did stop me probably from like, I don't know, moving out of the house sooner and getting connected with people sooner because there was this kind of weirdness around meeting up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you're like, when you're working now, you're targeting, are you, are you targeting people who are like coming out of school who like want to go and do this straight out of the gate? Are you targeting existing or, or both? Or? Yeah, kind of both. So people, well, we like people that are right out of graduate school because they don't have a lot of like terrible beliefs installed in them for like 30 years yeah. in the field. They're kind of like a clean slate and they can just like explode. But yeah. we also have a lot of people who maybe they have been working for someone else for 10 years and they're like, they finally feel ready to like take this step out on their own. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of people starting and it's also people that are like scaling or like switching up from insurance to cash pay and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. I feel like I'm learning more about this space as I talk to you more because I didn't even know what like cash pay, I guess so, like I was in roofing sales and it was like insurance or you pay out of your own pocket. So I mm -hmm. guess it's similar there in the sense, but yeah. So you work with more people that are like doing the cash pay stuff, right? Or you help yeah. them get more cash pay mm -hmm. clients. Okay, interesting. Is that, for those in that space, is that, I'd assume, more desirable for them? Or like, what, why, yeah. why do you target that? The um, insurance panels can pay terribly. They can pay like 60 bucks an hour, $70 an hour, and you have like very little control over how much you actually get paid, mm -hmm. versus the cash pay rate, you can set whatever rate you want, right? And so, for example, we have people in Austin who charge 175, 200 an hour, they're making three times as much per hour than on insurance. And it's like, there's a difference in quality of people. Like if someone actually is better, should they be able to set their own rate, you know, or have some kind of say over it? I don't know, these are kind of the questions around insurance or, or cash pay. Yeah. But um, that's what a lot of people, they want. And they also like insurance, you have to like write notes on everyone, give them a diagnosis. They a lot of times will like dispute your claim so they don't get, they don't pay you for the hours that you put in. So you have to like have a biller or like spend four hours a week fighting them trying to get on the phone. Mm. There's a lot of like very negative things with insurance that people would rather just like take cash. Someone else gets go yeah. The person. It's just like they put you in this box. At least working with insurance companies with roofing sales, like a lot of times, insurance company would total out a roof because we have a lot of hail here in Texas, and um, they'd be like, okay, this roof is worth eight thousand dollars. Like, go get a new one, and then like four roofing companies go out and they're like, guys, this roof is like 10K minimum. Like, and that's like, not even marking it up. Like that's just what it costs. And then you're just stuck in this back and forth battle with the insurance. Is it like that? Like where they, where they like lowball it a lot of times? Yeah, I mean, insurance companies make their money by paying out as little as possible. Yep. So they will try to actively dispute everything that they can so that they can make extra profit. Yeah. You know, they're driven by this, by a weird profit incentive, which is, really bad for a lot of people in the healthcare industry. So that's why insurance is like the best business model ever. That's why, yeah. that's why like any recession, anything that happens, like insurance is, they're always good, you know? They make money, yeah. Like, I mean, it's it's definitely like top one, two gross income industries like in the world at all times. Um, is is supplementing, is that like a thing supplementing in, in like what you do with the insurance companies? What do you mean, like having some insurance, some cash pay? So, like, so when we were in 
roof when I was in roofing, supplementing would be like, okay, the insurance company said this was worth eight thousand dollars. We say it's worth ten. Here's all the reasons why it should be ten, and we would say like give line items and be like, you forgot this, you forgot this, you forgot this, send it back. And then they eventually give us what we wanted. I assume that's not a thing with like the seven rates. So I think it's more just like time per hour. And they just basically pay yeah. for time. And they said, this is the, this is the thing you can, you can negotiate that you get a higher rate, um, yeah. but they can decline that and say, no, we didn't have enough providers in this area. Oh uh, yeah. It, I'm sure it's dependent on like where, like, a uh, therapist in Austin probably gets paid more than a therapist in like Killeen, well, it's super close, but like, no, this is I, I hear some people on like Medicare and they get paid 160 an hour. And then in other places, Blue Cross could be 84. It's like, it's somewhat random. Yeah. Like just being even in the higher paying city doesn't necessarily mean that you get paid more. Mm. It's almost like how many like providers there are determines it. Mm. Interesting. So I'm curious, like when you built your first, um, build your practice 1.0, we were on Kajabi, Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. Um, how were you getting leads at that time? So I didn't know how to get like therapists that were interested in this. So what I started out doing is I just went on this platform called psychology today, which lists out therapists and their phone numbers. And I started cold calling. Right. And it was like incredibly scary. I had to psych myself up for like six hours to like make a call to this random person and tell me to buy my product. Um, so I did that for maybe like, you know, the first 50 leads, got another 50 just from like going to the website and finding their emails all through kind of that psychology today. Um, and then eventually we pivoted towards like a webinar model, which was a different way of like sourcing leads, which was kind of this creative thing that I thought of. Interesting webinar model. Like were you running ads to? No. So I had this. This is like, this is like, I'm very much, and like, even if we're setting up this camera here, like, I'm very much kind of like, try to hack the system or do this like creative way, which like, if I would have just like, charged a higher price, went to Facebook ads right away, I probably could have gotten there faster, but it took me a while to figure out what the optimal path was. Yeah. I was on a listserv for my graduate school, um, which had every graduate student current, and once they graduate, they're still on this listserv. And so what I thought was like, I bet every single graduate program has one of these listservs. Mm -hmm. And our goal was to like tell graduate students, this is what you can do after you graduate. So what I did was I started scraping from .edu sites, all the program directors, because I knew those were the people who had the control of that email list. And they dropped up an email that was like, hey, I just graduated. We're running this organization, not company, organization that helps therapists know they, they can Launch a practice. This is a free like informational webinar. Would you would you be would you be open to like sharing it with your students? Um, and drafted up that email. Hired a VA to source two thousand of these program directors, and then I would send out like 100 to 200 emails a week. Of that, have like a 20, 10 to 20 percent like forward rate. You know, a lot of people that are like, "You're a company, screw you!" And like, this is amazing. Capitalist. <laughs> yeah, but we would generate like thirty like 20 to, 20 to 30 a week into the webinar, get like 20 people to show up, charge $150, you know, for the, the sign up and eventually the calls mm -hmm. and call fund a lot of it. But that was like, for the first year, it was just like doing that same thing. And then as well, like, you know, doing some Facebook reach outs, LinkedIn, like some other kind of sporadic stuff, but that was like the main engine. Yeah. Dude, that's so creative. I thought you were just gonna say, yeah, I ran some Facebook ads. <laughs> no, you did, you did like. I was so scared of spending money that I was like, how do I figure this out in like a scalable way? Yeah. And also, it, it still could work, it could work again, but like I wasn't charging any money, so you know, do all this work to make 300 bucks or something. Right. It's like, it doesn't really yeah. When did you realize that you were like grossly undercharging for the value? I, I booked a sales call with a. Uh, competitor don't tell this uh, like in 2020 and at that point they charged 5800 and I charged 100 and I was like so it takes me like you know 15 cold calls to get a hundred so I have to do like hundreds or thousands of cold calls to make what they make in one sale that was like a, a, a shift for me but it, it still took like years to like actually feel yeah. confident raising it myself was uh, I'm curious like you said you were somewhat inspired by 
the course that Gabriel St. Germain put out. Was his a, like a lower ticket like that as well? Yeah, like a 297 or something. He made 400,000 off it? Yeah, so that's like, he had an audience of 100,000 people on YouTube. I had no audience, so I was like, well, yeah. I'll keep it cheap that I can get a lot of people. But like, that's not how it works. Unless you have a really killer audience already established. Or you play the long game, right? Like I told you when I started my community, so like $9 a month, mm -hmm. now it's, you know, it's high ticket price point. But it's like in that time, and I'm sure you did the same, like you were able to get so many results and testimonials that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So like, assuming you plan on doing this for more than like six months a year, I mean, in hindsight, it probably helped you get better, faster, build the product. So that way, when people do come in at a higher price point, they're like, they're not like, dude, what, what the hell is this? Like, yeah. I want a refund. They're like, wow, this is worth it every penny and I'm gonna make the money back. Um, when uh, when did the program evolve from like $100, $150, you know, little group, or uh, I'm sorry, little Facebook group, Kajabi course, like when did it become more than just that? It, it went to like 500 in the middle of 2020. And then towards the end, I had people that were like requesting websites and I kind of learned to build a WordPress website on a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. And so I started to like, I practice, like I put that into the pitch, you know? And I was like, well, if I'm gonna build a website, that's worth 500 bucks. Yep. Which is worth more than 500 bucks. <laughs> I was like, okay, what? 500 plus 500 is a thousand bucks. I pitched it on a webinar and someone bought it. And I was like, Holy shit, you know? So then, then the website became a piece of it. Um, and I just kind of, yeah, like just started to grow and it became more like, as we expanded more and more, it's become, there was an agency component of like, what do people not want to do? We take that and solve it for them. And we do the coaching. What type of coaching do they like? What type of like modules do they like? And like try to build it around what people wanted. Mm -hmm. um, but that was then a thousand. I think later at the end of 2020, when I started launching Facebook ads, I'm like, my margin will not work at a thousand dollars on cold traffic with Facebook ads with yeah. like how that was at sales. So then went up to 2000. Yeah. How, uh, how did you learn to do webinars? How did I learn to do webinars? Um, probably like YouTube, like everything I learned was just from YouTube in the beginning. It was like, go watch a Russell Brunson webinar. Um, go, go through these funnels. I remember I was like, went through a funnel. This is before I ever started dropshipping. And it was this guy selling a dropshipping course for 1200 bucks on, on a webinar for a three hour. It looked like it was live, it was an automated webinar. And I watched the Sam Evans webinar. And like I watched a bunch of these webinars and kind of just put together my own mm -hmm. presentation. And then probably like fill it in with like YouTube videos of like how to present. And then yeah. just doing it, you know, you do it a hundred times mm -hmm. like you figure out what works. I know like webinars are, you know, I feel like they, they go away for a little bit and then they come back and then people go crazy about them. Like obviously Hormozzi just had his. Um, looking back at like your earlier webinars, were they, like do you kind of cringe when you think about them or like were they were they pretty good, pretty structured? They were pretty good. Like by the end of it, we just did the same webinar for a year, probably a year and a half. Like I kept running the webinar for a while. Um, but I got really good. We got amazing responses because it was literally just, it was structured like here's the actual information it was like business foundations mindset like 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 some of the legal and operational stuff and people get like people loved it they went they went away with getting something whether or not they bought something at the end of the year um so it was i was really proud of like what i did to get this started it was like this creative way that i got leads for free and it wasn't the most profitable but it worked too yeah so you um, how, I'm curious, like how many people would show up to a webinar and then they would like kind of, you know, they start seeing you around, start watching your stuff. Like, would you find that people show up to a webinar and then like two or three months later, they're like, Hey, you guys like, I, you know, that thing that you talked about, I'm kind of interested. Like, can I, can I still do it? Did you ever have any of that? Um, not until I started ha like actually emailing my email list. And like now this is a practice that I'm in. Yeah. So I still have people now who are like, I watched your webinar three years ago and they sign up for my full program. Like for context, you know, the one person who comes three years later is worth so much more than yeah. like the entire year of work. So it's this thing that keeps compounding. Yeah. But like, yeah, people, 
it's usually the email list or some other, you know, I thought of you and then they like reach out and it's a very warm lead, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, like year one, year two, year three, like it keeps, it keeps staying off. It's so like, just having those assets, be it you know, social media, if you want to call them an asset or like an email list, like, I feel like it's so hard to truly understand what they can turn into if you continue to grow them and then like nurture them. Yeah. Because I, I have the same thing, dude. Like, have people who I get on a call with, it's like this guy, I have no idea who he is. He said, I've watched all 25 episodes of your podcast. I've seen all the results. I've seen all this. Like, dude, you don't even have to pitch me. Just take, take the card or whatever. <laughs> and like, I don't know. You know, that's not like every call by any means, but I'm sure you've had it as well, where it's like, I've been watching you for a long time. I've seen your results. It's like, yeah, tell me about, tell me about it. But like, I'm, I'm already going to do it, yeah. you know, which is a sales person. It's like the best. Thing. Yeah. A lot of that's, that's the thing I've been learning more and more. You know, I learned a lot about sales, but it's like, if you can do most of your selling and your marketing, then it's just much easier, you know, dude. Um, and it's preferable. Like I like when I had someone go on a call all the time, like, oh my God, you're like, you're like real, you're like a real person, you know? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, watch content. It's like, I'm just so excited. It's just not a hard sale at all. Yeah. You know? Sometimes it's, it's funny too, because like you and I, we each had these people that we kind of looked up to when we got into online business and maybe some of them are super flashy and maybe some of them not, but like, you know, you have a, you have an audience, I have an audience and like, sometimes I forget like that p people will see us that way. And like, dude, I'm just a normal dude. You know, like I'm just a normal dude who built something online. Um, like I wear, I wear dirty, sweaty covers like everybody else, you know, um, which is just funny. And then that as a sales guy, it's like, as a sales guy who has control over marketing or control over the, the systems and processes that yeah. people go through before, dude, it's, I just, I just love having that being a sales guy without that. And like just being, you know, having to take whatever kind of leads they show your way is terrible. Yeah. It's like, you have to have an understanding of the marketing because like, did the lead not close because the offer is bad or because you didn't do good discovery or because there's just no trust established or because they're not a good fit for exactly what the offer, you know, is supposed to do. It's like, you have to kind of backtrack to like see the whole journey and understand the whole journey. I think to like, know like fully why them didn't close like, or what sort of content should I get between a close call and a follow up call mm -hmm. to like warm them up specifically? What sort of language is going to resonate with them? It's, it's, it's all kind of intertwined, you know? Yeah. Um, but like the, the kind of person on the phone matters a lot in addition to your sales process, but you kind of should close everyone. Like you should have the yeah. ideal client and is marketing actually getting those people in? And then from there is the sales process educating them in addition to trying to close them on yeah. this new opportunity. I mean, dude, like it's funny, the further I get into this remote space and I help like a lot of teams and I, you know, I'm still a, a recently sales manager, but like I see it, I see these funnels in different businesses at the same time. And it's like the best, most dialed in sales process is one where you get on a call and you don't have to sell anything. Like there's so much power in that because then, you know, once you remove the piece of you being worried about like, Oh, I have to like convince this person, then it's truly about like, okay, this is what you want. This is what we have. Is this a good fit? And you're able to, you know, even walk away from, or not walk away, but like not give offers when not needed versus if you're put in, you know, you have, you have sales reps, right? And I've worked with tons of sales reps. If you're put in that environment where it's like, dude, I, I just have to hit KPIs, then you're going to close people who shouldn't have been closed. You're going to put people on like crazy payment plans. Like, dude, I heard the other day, I heard the other day, somebody got put on a three year payment plan at $87 a month for a three month fitness program. <laughs> like that's insane. That's a month dude. For a fitness program for 87 a month for three years. So there's interest. It's yeah, not really yeah. interest. Yeah. I think it's like a $2,500 program with like crazy interest. But yeah, dude, <laughs> like the, the further I get into this and especially as I start to run and, and like grow my own offer, it's like, mm -hmm. I, I don't. I'm going to sell it in the marketing. And then when we get on a call, it's truly like, is it a good fit? 
yes, okay, we're onboarding. Is it a bad fit? We're gonna know within five minutes. Yeah, you know, and let's figure that out together. And that is a much better way to actually approach like the sales. And you sell a lot more people, I think, doing it that way. Yeah. Now, if you're like incredibly skilled at sales, you can just sell anyone that you want. Yeah. Just because you're that good at basically manipulating human thought, but like, <laughs> I think this is like a, a good way to. Yeah. Yeah. And sales doesn't have to be like you don't have to sell something that's like where people feel like they're a victim of it. You know, it's like you can be a salesperson and then when people get off that conversation, they're like hyped for what is to come. They're like, dude, this is gonna change my life. It's gonna change everything. Um, which, you know, at the end of the day, I know I feel a lot better when I sell something like that because I've been on both sides of it, man. I've sold things that like I 100% believed in. I was even like a product of, and then the other side where it's like, I was selling people into this and it's short lived, but like selling people into things and like I've seen them not get the result and I was like, it's probably not, it's probably not where I should say and you know, move on. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to ask you, so when you, going back to like the progression of build your practice, um, you were running the webinars and then you upped the price to 500 at what price point did you start running like sales calls like one on one? Five hundred. So like I would book like six sales calls. I would do thirty minutes. I like I just I had no sales process. I learned from Jordan Belfort sales school on YouTube. He's like, sound fair enough? I'm like, this guy <laughs> that does sound fair. You know, and yeah. I just tried to like like piece piecemeal it all together on these thirty minute calls. So they'd be warmed through like this this webinar and then they go into these calls, you know, and it's a 30 minute call and I'm trying to like ask questions, just random questions. Do I don't even know if I had an organized pitch and then Mike's trying to say, that's like 500 bucks. And then they tell me, oh, I'll think about it. I'll get back to you tomorrow. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, and like, they kept doing that and they didn't, they didn't get back to me, you know? And just like, I don't know, it was a kind of a trial by fire. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Those calls. But it was like really low stakes calls. It was $500, but I was not closing. Dude, it, it's so funny. Like when you first start selling and then you get, you get someone who's like, yeah, I'll think about it. And you're like, yeah, they said they were going to think about it. Like you're hyped. You're like, they're going to, they're going to come back like tomorrow's tomorrow's yeah. for sure. <laughs> Dude. Like I remember when I first started cold calling, I was cold. I was trying to do like Facebook ads for like dentists and realtors and chiropractors, like all that stuff. Dude, I wish I had those recordings, man. The worst, like I even knew at that time that it was, I was like, dude, I'm getting steamrolled on this. <laughs> like, this is not good. But like now knowing what I know, um, dude, I wish I had those recordings. Just like reaching the receptionist and they're like, oh, the doctor's busy right now, but I can take a message. And I was like, okay, oh, yeah, okay. okay, well, let me tell you all about it. And, oh dude, I mean, you just yeah. gotta learn. You yeah, gotta kind yeah. of get kicked in the face. It's the same, and that's again. There's there's an athlete to salesperson pipeline. Yeah. Well, because it's like you kind of gotta learn a lot of those lessons by like failing. Like there's not really another way to like understand the tonality. If someone's like, yeah, I'm gonna think about it and get back to you until you've like kind of been in it and like seen those situations come up to your mind. You're like, wait, uh, okay, but let me ask you a question. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Sales is like. You, you can't beat sales. I think that's why like, it's just, just like entrepreneurship, it's like watered down entrepreneurship, right? Uh, well, like really watered down, but <laughs> yeah, dude, it's like, it's the same feeling. It's like, you gotta, if you wanna eat, you have to kill for it, you know? You gotta work hard, you gotta do just whatever it takes, really. Unless you're in, you know, some of those sales jobs out there, they give you like six figure base, it's nice and cozy, you know, you just, Here's your little task for the day. Talk to a couple of people, but it's not a bad life by any means, but you can only do so much there. So, but going back, I keep like getting away from what I'm meaning to ask you. <laughs> um, $500 price point in sales. You know, you start taking the sales call. Were you running that simultaneously with a webinar? Were you like, okay, now it just makes sense to go to a sales calls. Like what distinguished that? Part of it was like, I, I didn't feel comfortable most of the time, like pitching directly on the webinar. Cause I had kind of leveraged the trust of these, you know, educational mm -hmm. institutions to say, can you send this to your students? It's a free webinar. And then I sell at the end. 
I still did that a lot of times, but I was like, if I make it so it's like, it's a choice, hey, if you want to learn more, you can schedule a one-on-one call with me. Mm-hmm. That I never had a problem with. I was like, that'll do it. And then I was like, I think it'll convert more one-to-one, I think. But I just kind of started, I would, I would kind of experiment. So sometimes I would do it on the, the webinar, sometimes I would do it on the calls. Okay. So five, I mean, $500, that was late 2020? Uh, mid 2020, raised to a thousand, like October 2020, and then like 2000 by December. Okay. So, you, what was like giving you the courage to just continuously raise? Was it the results or was it like I'm still working towards that 5,800 or what was it? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it was that was one of the things I remember. Like, we, we brought in this one clinician right out of graduate school and she was like making 4,000 a month. And she was like celebrating it. She's like, I'm like, it's 5,000. I'm like, I'm like, she just started her business like three months, or like four months ago. I'm like, I started my business eight months ago. I'm not making 4,000 a month. And I was like, I charge her like $100 a month for five months. I was like, maybe, maybe this could, you know, like there was, that was like a lot of these disconnects of like, they're actually making money on this and seeing what other people were charging. And then I threw in the websites, like the actual amount of work, like this was, this was a lot more yeah. valuable. And then the Facebook ads cost money. And then like, I realized I had expenses beyond just what the thing was costing Yeah, expenses. And so like, I don't know, I just started to like raise it and then always add more value on top. Yeah. What a going from, you know, 2020 going from a hundred bucks all the way up to a thousand, 2000. Uh, what did your like team look like? Was it just you at that time? Just me. Yeah. My business partner would do like, you know, an hour a week check in, maybe like like a couple hours a week. But for the first like two years, it was basically just me grinding away, learning everything. Like I did all the website design, I did all the coaching, I built all the videos, I did all the marketing, I did all the sales. It was like it was just like I learned every skill. But like I, I don't know if that's the smartest thing. It just took a long time to like get yeah. to a good place. I think it's good that again in hindsight, it's probably good that you did that because now. You just have so much more, you know, knowledge on how it should function, right? But I can imagine you were probably working a lot, right? Yeah, a good amount. And then it's also, I think, there's probably a decent amount of procrastination too. Like, I wanted to work 12-hour days. And I would, like, some days, but I, I didn't know what to work on. <laughs> so it was like, uh, yeah, like I was, it did feel like a lot though. Yeah. You know, it felt like I was when did you get to the point where you were like, and I assume another price increase was what got you there, but you were like, okay, now we're hitting like levels of scale. Like this is, this has the potential to be like a bigger business than, you know, a hundred dollar product could, could create. Um, that's probably more recent in the last like year or two. Like, I think when I started adding team members, which was like the end of 2021, I kind of, I was like, okay, and also I learned to, in order to hire people, you have to have a vision. You know, you can't yeah. just be like, well, I'm just trying to make like 10K a month. Like you, no, yeah. people are not gonna join your team if you say that. Like, you have to have a reason why you're doing the things you're doing. Yeah. And so I always had like, I had a big vision, but it didn't really crystallize to like this being, like this being an avenue that gets to 20 million a year until like, you know, I kept expanding and like the vision has kind of expanded more and more and the bigger I've grown. Yeah. Well, who was your first hire? Um, I think it was Linda who's still on the team to just kind of do some of the coaching, like come in, help do, do a couple hours of the one-on-one coaching because I was selling, at that point we were five grand, we were doing one-on-one coaching. So I, uh, yeah, gave her some coaching, hired my other friend Greg to do some like some of the website design. These are like two to four hour a week yeah. kind of rules. Okay, cool. What, uh, and, and you do have a co-founder, right? Mm-hmm. So what was that like, like ever since the beginning you had the co-founder? Mm-hmm. How did you, how did you meet that person? On the airplane. Oh, you built it with her? Yeah, yeah. Oh shoot, dude, I thought like. No, we met on an airplane, we started emailing, we met up, we didn't meet up for like another nine months or, or 12 months. Cause it was through COVID and stuff, but we were just like email communication. Zooms. Dude, I, 
I don't know if you said that and I like didn't even pick <laughs> up on it, but I was like, I thought you just took what you learned from that person and like ran with yeah, it. Yeah. Um, okay, well that's that's cool. So like, what is it like, you know, going from with with the co-founder and I've never experienced like everything that I've done up until this point in this online space, it's been kind of like solo, mm-hmm. which I know is probably like, I'd probably be further if I went with a co-founder or like a partner on some of these things, but that's besides the point. What, what has it been like, like with the partner, the co-founder as you like gone through the years? It's been good. Um, I really believe in relationships. And like, I believe in the power of compounding relationships and relationships get better over time. But like my business partner and I have been working together for like four years now. And there's value in that beyond the size of the company, all this stuff, like that's a cool achievement, you know, that like for both of us, that we can maintain a business relationship and the business continues to grow and the team keep, keeps getting better and the product keeps getting better. And we, we keep working together and we have fun working together. Like, yeah. um, I think it's great. And I think it's great to, cause it's lonely enough. Like it's, it's, it's good to have someone else to like shoulder the burden with, you know, mm-hmm. that you can legitimately talk about like all the shit that's going on. And then you're like, yes, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll help with this thing. You help with this thing. It was, it's, it's something you don't always have with like, like employees on the team yeah. as much as with the co-founder. What's the, what's the division of labor look like between you two? Right now she's, you know, kind of more the COO running the team. Like I, I built out, like I was kind of doing the sales and running the team, but I brought her in and she's kind of expanded her role to like almost like completely leave. Cause she was, she, she didn't do as much on BYP at the beginning cause she was running a very successful private practice. So she was making multiple six figures. She had 15 people in a wellness center that she had built. It's like, she was fucking doing shit. Nice. And so she started to expand and then taking more like the people role and kind of fulfillment. Um, so leading the coaching calls and the coaching team and making sure that that's organized. I'm more the sales and marketing. So it's almost like external focus versus internal focus. Yeah. Now we both kind of do a little bit of both, but I'm focused more on the sales and marketing side for now. I kind of would like to come back into products, which like if I get sales manager and the sales team kicking up, I might like focus more on marketing and product. product. Yeah. But right now it's, yeah, I'm heavily involved in sales. And revenue. How, let's imagine <clears throat> you didn't meet her on the plane and you still had that like entrepreneurial drive. Let's say you started the same business. Like where do you think you would be now if you didn't have like her expertise and her help like over the years? I mean, I just don't think the business would work. Like it wouldn't have gotten into here without her. Cause it's like, I mean, it's also like, she's also got so much passion for the field, which I do too, but it's good to like have someone to keep staying on the same path. Like I probably would have experimented with different stuff. Yeah. Truth is, I have no idea where I would be if, yeah. if I didn't have that idea. Cause I did and I went all in on that idea. I find it cool that you like, besides the drop shipping thing, you like found, you found the model and you just, kept going. It, yeah. I can't say the same. Like now, you know, lately I've been doing the same thing for a little bit of time, but like, dude, I tried, tried so much, like so much. And well, I'm like, if I would have, if I would have said, no, let's table this, let me go into sales for six months and then came back in, it probably would have been better. But like, I've just been so stubborn. I'm just like, I'm just going to work harder and do more, yeah. which I, I think has paid off for me in a way. But yeah. I mean, there's also other ways that might be better, you know, I think it's, I think there's, there's trade-offs. Yeah. I mean, the results show, you know, it's like, you don't, you don't just build what you've built by, you know, halfway, like putting in the effort, right? Like you, I guess it's been in the grand scheme of things, it's been three, four years. Like it hasn't been that long and you've built something that is pretty large and it's only going to get larger, you know, as it seems right now. Um, and imagine if you were like, I don't know, imagine, by the way, yeah, the sun is getting, it's getting hot. It's getting hot. Uh, we can take a sun break and we can, uh, we can, we should take a sun break. We can close this down. All right, let's take a sun break. We'll edit it. (laughs) We're back from our, from our sun break. And we realized that 
all of our effort put into the cameras was, uh, it, it didn't pay off how we yeah. thought it would, but we'll see. We'll see how much audio we still have, but you know, we're, we're making it work, you know, until we can get a, a videographer out here, we're going to do what yeah. we can. Yeah. Good thing we, we set up two cameras, so I don't know which one we're going to use, but, um, so yeah, we're, let's, let's think we're, 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 we're talking about your co-founder. Mm -hmm. We're talking about where, like, what would build your practice be without your co-founder? Let's say in an alternate universe, you never met her. Unfortunately, you didn't go, you didn't go pro with soccer. Like, what do you think you'd be doing? It's so hard to say. Like, I feel like I, I'm inclined towards sales. I, I, I'm inclined towards entrepreneurship and I really resonate a lot with like Paul Graham stuff. Uh, like the beginning was a bunch of white combinator, like software startups. Like there's a chance I might have just tried to like start a software company because that's what could be a billion dollar thing. Like I could see something like that, but I probably would have just chased soccer for a lot longer until I figured that out. I had a friend who, um, and I was kind of thinking, I'm sorry, this is a business at the beginning, but he, he told me like he trained with pros, soccer player, made no money, but he started training kids and it's like, I charge $20 an hour but I had like 20 kids. So I made $400 an hour training them and playing soccer. And he's like, I basically did that multiple times a week. And then he ended up starting a gym and like having a full business on like training kids in soccer. Mm. That might've been a business model I would have tried to, to be like, can I make 400 bucks an hour? So there's like, I would have probably like stayed along the same route for a while, yeah. but eventually would have shifted into business in some, some way. Yeah. You mentioned the, <clears throat> the software piece and like, Still, like to this day, yeah, people are building softwares. A lot of people with successful agencies and coaching programs are just like, hey, it just makes sense. Do you ever see yourself looking into that with like anything you're currently doing? Yeah, I, I got some flack at this for this because I said this is a mastermind event. And they're like, you should focus on your current business. But I'm like, I want to learn the skill sets of what it takes to run a multi million dollar organization, you know, eight figure organization. Uh, and then I want to be able to continue to take that into future projects that I have, right? It's like, how do I be a really good operator, leader, person, like vision caster? Yeah. And I'd like to take those new things that can be in technology, a nuclear fusion company, you know, can build yeah. a huge sales organization. Like, I, I don't know. Um, but I like, I also think that I can continue down the same vein that I'm on. And I can probably create all of those and make spin off companies and can make budget practice in a million dollar company. Yeah. Is that the vision? Yeah, the vision is to get to like 20, 30 million a year. I think like Jim Launch does those numbers. And so like being able to like dominate the niche and have a bunch of different offerings um, that can provide for like education at the beginning levels, teach people how to grow their practice, building mega centers and, and large group practice models and just being kind of have like multiple different players, places that we service, um, kind of being big in education. And, create a new graduate program. It's like, there's, there's a lot of stuff we yeah. can do. Um, and then, and then, yeah, like kind of see, yeah, that the gym launch model, it seems to be similar, but different, obviously completely different like fields, but with like seeing that and like, I feel like all of us in this space was like, Oh, Ramosi did this. And like, everyone knows what he's up to. Um, has that given you like assurance that, this can work to the scale that you want it to? Yeah. Well, I mean, when I found Hermosi, I found him before he was cool. Like, I saw an Alex Becker video and he was like, this guy is a 35 to 1 internal ad spend. And I was like, who's this guy? You know? And I looked him up and he had just had like a little bit of YouTube videos that were just about gyms and, and you know, like 800 views on a podcast. And I like started to see, but he would talk about his whole business model upsells and like how they structure fulfillment have their onboarding processes and like going deep on how this business operated and i was like that's the same business that i have which is better <laughs> and so i i i've modeled a lot of stuff with the product on that and so yeah like that's been incredibly helpful a lot of his newer content is like should you start a business but like his legit here's yeah. the ins, ins and outs of running business is very good which i know he now saves for his people he he acquires yeah. Interesting. I've seen, um, like, I, I think I picked up on him not as early as you did, but before he started becoming mainstream and I caught like some of that content that was like 
super intricate on what it takes to actually grow and scale a business. I'm like, this dude knows what he's talking about. And I'm, I'm over here like, I don't, I don't even know. Like, who am I to say this guy knows what he's talking about? But like, I was like, yeah, this guy is like actually, actually spinning. Um, which, you know, now looking at it, it's like, he is, he is kind of that guy. It's like, oh, the best 10 ways to make money online. Or whatever. Because that's what reaches the biggest audience. Yeah. And if you're maximizing for reaching the biggest audience, it's like, you only get like 3,000 views in a video. That's like scaling from 10 million a year to 100 million because there's so few people who that's actually relevant for. Yeah. But it's, it's all part of the plan, right? So, smart guy. <laughs> he's he's, he's like got it. Well, yeah. yeah. Do you, um, I noticed like, and we spoke about it, you've been going harder on like content lately, right? And I think right now a lot of, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the business that you guys are generating is off of just paid media? That- yeah, but it's like paid media, like it, it all flows together. Media is kind of media. Right. Um, paid you pay for, media you pay your time for. Yeah. Um, a lot of people will come into paid ads and they'll go through the email list or they'll go watch a video and then they'll, they'll opt in again and that person will call them. And it's like, there's so many different touch points people go through mm-hmm. that um, YouTube, me growing my own personal Instagram, us growing the, the business's Instagram, um, doing more email less than better will be a huge part of, again, getting people coming to sales calls who like know who we are. Yeah. It's like a straight paid, paid ads funnel is a hard thing to get people on cold traffic yeah. and for them to be the best clients that are going to stick and refer people. Yeah. When, when you sign a new client on, like how many times had they just been consuming your content for weeks or months before? Like what are the, the ratio of like straight through the, the paid ad, like book a call closed versus like got into your ecosystem and watched for a little bit and then closed. It's probably like 30% that are not like watched for a bit. Yeah. That's probably most people come from email. I mean, like, like a lot of people are like, I read probably a hundred emails and finally booked a call. It's like, they're usually ready to sign up. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of people who go through paid ads, but we, we, we have a two call process. We warm them up with content in between steps. So it's like, you kind of force them into watching videos and like relevant content before the close call. Um, yeah. No matter what. I have, um, I've always known that I should be collecting emails, but I know I am not doing what I should with those emails. Like every once in a while I'll mail the list, but like you said, you mentioned like an email yeah. list a few it's, times. Like email list makes tens of thousands of dollars a month. Like, and especially if you nurture it consistently and it's like, you gotta learn like basics of copywriting, but if you do that two to three times a week or you do it daily, it'll make you $20,000 a month, like depending on your audience size, but I imagine with your audience size, like you, like, and you can hire a copywriter to do that stuff for you, you know, pay them, pay them 10% or whatever. You just, you know, book people in, but like a lot of it's like client win Monday, client win Wednesday. And you just, the same thing that you do on other platforms anyway, yeah. But you put that in an email of a call, or you say like real copywriting, which is like, do you feel this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, right? But what if it were possible to feel this way, this way, this way, this way, this way? Yeah. Right. But what if it was actually as simple as this? Book a call. Do you write all your emails? I do, yeah. How, how do you balance? Because, you know, I, for me personally, I, I'm on tons of email lists and just being in the game, it's like, I know what the... I know what everybody's trying to do, right? They're trying to sell you something, uh, whether it's like a hard call to action or there's really none at all. Like the big agenda is like, we have something to sell you, right? How do you write emails in a way where like you get people to open them because they're genuinely interested like time and time again versus like, you know, I'm someone who's really already interested, they're gonna look at the email, right? But like someone who's like, oh, build your practice. Like this might be relevant to me. How do you like properly nurture them? Do you switch up the styles of content and the, you know, where I you mean, direct them all that? The way I would think about it basically is like everyone's interested in themselves and everyone's interested in stories that are relevant to the story that they're currently going through. And so like a lot of, I think how I've paced it out, like I try to teach what I can. And like, if you can reframe a belief of somebody, like, and you have sales calls with people all the time, so you know what beliefs are reframed. Yeah. That's always valuable to be able to put out. If you can share a story 
and what the person had to go through to change their situation to go from A to B, that's always valuable. I have people, I reach out to like former prospects and they're like, like, oh, I saw you open my emails. They're like, yeah, I find it really inspiring. And it's, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm pitching client results and setting it yeah. up for a call. But it is inspiring because it's like, look at the transformation, look at the transformation, look at the transformation. And, and people will usually, even if they've already gone through your stuff and they've already like succeeded themselves, they still look at that stuff because it's like, that's so cool, that's so cool. Again, you, you cut out the like, all the work yeah. that goes in between reaching A, A to B, but that's always interesting to people. Yeah, dude, I gotta go harder. I gotta go harder on the email list. Um, we've, we've recently been talking about paid ads and I've been like messing around and uh, Jonathan, shout out Jonathan, he put me on a little bit of game. So I think um, email is something I've been slacking on. And it's like being, again, going back to like the whole solo thing, it's like there's a lot of stuff that I know should be happening, but because the business and you know, the stuff going on is where it is. Revenue wise, it's like, sometimes it makes sense to hire. Sometimes it's like, I should wait, I should grind it out. How do you, I mean, you've obviously got a co-founder, but I'm sure you still find yourself in that situation where it's like, okay, let's, let's get to this revenue mark and then we'll hire this. Like, how do you figure out when is the right time to hire somebody? That's the $10 million <laughs> question, isn't it? It's like, yeah. um, you know, I could probably run principles that I've used myself, like the buyback principle from Dan Martell. It seems like a great one. It's like, if your time is going towards this thing, find someone to replace the time. If you have a next high leverage activity, um, that seems like a great principle. I, I more so, more so have that. It's like, there seems to be this overflow on fulfillment on this side. Like, can we get a person to solve that? But sometimes it's like, you actually have to figure out a system to solve that rather than a person. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know that I'm actually like, the best at that. I think it's more like, I want to grow to this level. Here's what I think the team needs to be in order to get there. And I'm willing to sacrifice profit in the short term to get the chance to get there because I'll never get past this if I'm always doing the same thing. So I think in, in, in my mind, it's almost been like, I need to reshape the team or build the team in order to achieve X goal. And I kind of try to like hire the, the building blocks to put the team together, like on a sales team or on the product team. Yeah. It's like, to fulfill X amount of customers per month. I know I need to do this and this and this and this. It's going to take this amount of people. Yeah. Yeah, that's everything again, everything I've done by myself, but I, I haven't even really considered that, like that next, like the way that you're speaking about this now, I can tell you've like vividly imagined like what this looks like and how it feels and all this stuff. I feel like I haven't even thought about that before. Like I'm, now these thoughts are like going through my mind. It's like, what does that look like for me? So that's like my favorite activity to do is like plan out the next thing and what are all the pieces that need to be in place. I think I like kind of like building the system and like looking at it from the top. Yeah. Of the yeah. Do you think like with all this, I mean, entrepreneurs, a lot of times they have like different skill sets and areas of like, you know, they prefer to spend their time and focus. Do you, I mean, would you call yourself like, I guess your, your operating style, like your entrepreneurial style, like what, what would you say is like your forte or like, what do you, what do you have the most fun with? Um, it's a hard thing. Uh, I kind of like marketing and sales. Um, but I think that might also just be because that was what was necessary for the first many yeah. years of the business. Um, I like putting the pieces together. I think I like systems. Um, I really just like creativity though. Like I love to think yeah. and to plan and to like come up with little solutions. Um, I like to use my mind in creative ways. I like, I like to like drink some coffee and like, what about this and what, and then like go do some research and go like I, I think I am a, a thinker decision maker type yeah um, and that's what I really like to do and so sometimes I don't want to do the 12 hours of execution to go do yeah. it for myself but I like the kind of visualizing yeah, vision casting and putting the plan in place yeah you said you said drink your coffee not gorilla mind are you still yeah, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to cycle it you know <laughs> it, was, it was really interesting like 
like it was like last week. It was like Monday I drank it, I felt amazing. Tuesday I didn't drink it, I felt terrible. Wednesday I drank <laughs> it, I felt amazing. I'm like, I don't know that I want to depend on this thing. That's funny. So, but like today I didn't drink it and I felt great. So I was like, I, I think I can control it. It's just an extra boost, but yeah, it's a lot of caffeine. And I'm like, uh, I guess if I'm going to do this, I got to do it every day. Maybe yeah. there's a value I have to do it. And then it, it just so easily becomes, you know, Two and day, two and one, like yeah, one day a week. Like, mm, you it's know, a slippery it's, slope. I don't know. I'll explain something about like depending on substances like caffeine or something. It's like if you just get good sleep, you'll probably be fine. Yeah. So that's where I'm. I don't know. I'm like kind of back and forth. But when you yeah. extra boost, I'm like really like I did it like last weekend. I like wrote down a whole finance document, a whole like sales planning document, a whole like marketing document. I was like, it was good to just like yeah lock in. Yeah, just lock in. Yeah. I was gonna I was gonna say something about how you mentioned you're more of like the thinker, like visionary type. I think that's me as well. Um, a lot of my the stuff that I do, again doing it solo, but I've got a girlfriend that like helps me with a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, she's she's definitely more of like operational person. Like she, she's really good at like here's a list of things that need to be done, get it done. And then she like will come back and she'll be like, oh, like, yeah, I've got all these notes and all these things are done, but this happened and I'm like, that that would have taken me out of like my zone of genius so much. And it's like, wow, like she should be making more money than she is. <laughs> so it, it's so hard to switch back and forth like between the two because to get in that like creative zone of genius it literally takes like 30 to 45 minutes before you're there, right? Yeah. It's one of the things I, I, I open up my calendar because I'm, I'm doing sales calls right now. Oh, dude. I open so up my calendar on Saturdays and I have my sales guys that book in one call in the middle of the day. And it just, it so fucks up the like yeah. the energy of the day to just have one call, dude. which is such a different energy of like planning on having a business versus like selling this person who may not have watched any videos and then it's coming to the call cold and it's like, who are you guys and why should I go with you? And I'm like, this is not, yeah, not for it, me right now. <laughs> you know? The absolute worst is like when you open up a calendar for like Saturday or Sunday or maybe a holiday and yeah. like maybe you were out doing something <laughs> with people and then you go you go home, get ready for your call, then don't show they up. don't show up on a Saturday. I'm like, Dude, I, it I is, had to leave. Yeah. I rushed home so I can make this and you didn't show up. Every time, dude, it's... It's like every time that happens, I'm like, yeah, this is why I don't take calls on Saturdays. And then something comes up where it's like, I should probably take calls on Saturdays. And it's like a cycle, just like, uh, it was recently labor day and I had a full, full calendar, like back to back to back. I think some of those were like second and third calls. And there were some other calls mixed in there, but I had four new demo calls, four out of four, either no show or canceled. And I was like, yeah, this is why. This is why every year on these holidays, I say I, uh, I'm not going to do it. It's, it's better to usually take the day off. I, um, although a couple of the calls from Labor Day this weekend turned into sales, so like, that's hard to know. But I had one, it was Memorial Day a couple months ago, and it was like, everyone who looked at my calendar was like, between 65 and 75, and like, not really interested. The ones who did show, and the rest didn't show. And I was like, this was like, such a waste of a day. Yeah. It's such a waste of energy. Yeah, but it is like, you said on Labor Day, it's like the ones that do pay off, like it pays off and you're like, okay, this is why I do That's it. kind of the game. It's like, you gotta kind of just roll with the punches, whatever it is. Yeah. It's, dude, it's so weird when people, and maybe people book calls and they don't realize it's a holiday. Like, oh, okay. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be out with people. Yeah. But, but yeah, dude, it's like you book a call, like you show all this interest, you book a call and it's weird. I wouldn't, I don't know that I ever have like booked a sales call shown to the call. Yeah, dude. It's a weird thing when people do that. Is it, I mean, for me at least, like, especially being a sales guy, like knowing how these, you know, these teams work and stuff, it's like, if I book a call, like I'm probably already going to buy. Do you, yeah. do you operate like that too? Yeah, for the most part, I do a lot of research on people. Like, I do a lot of trust coming in before I go on with the call. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I just went like completely normie, clicked on an ad, booked a call, and it was like, like hoping they would not hoping, but like seeing if they would sell me on it. Like I, I used to sell fitness and dude, the, the people that we would opt that would opt into our sales calls, 
it was just like, it's like, dude, you don't have to be here. <laughs> like, you're the one who booked the call. It's like, it's like you're, and it, it is fitness. Yeah. Like, they're like, Ugh. but it's like, dude, the types of people that you speak to, I imagine you speak to like all different types, but like in something like fitness where it could be so broad or, you know, what I'm doing now, like we're, we're helping people uh, raise capital. It's the team that I'm the manager for. And it's like one call, I got no show by JFK's nephew, like last week. And then like the next call could be like this dude who he's like, oh yeah, I just like, I want to buy a house. I'm looking for like $50,000. Can you like, just for context. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for context, like <laughs> our, our common like capital raise range is like one to 10 million. And like, if you're raising anything below 500, it just doesn't make sense. And if you're below, if you're at like a hundred, it's like, dude, what, what are you doing here? And so like one day I got, or got no show by JFK's nephew. And then the next day it's like this guy who just probably should walk into a bank or something and like, I don't know. But sell like the types of varying prospects on sales calls is like. You, you learn a lot, it's, it's interesting. I've probably I've done over a thousand sales calls at this point and I've definitely seen pretty much everyone that I talk to has a master's degree, but like, such a huge difference in range of people yeah. all across the, the country and like different life situations. Um, but you learn a lot about like these different cities and like how people talk and like their career aspirations. And you know, like people I talk to in San Francisco and New York are much different than like rural Kentucky, you know? Yeah. What are, and so this, dude, this is something where you could probably provide a lot of value to like, I mean, my audience is a lot of salespeople, people in this online space, but like, most people don't get to the point of taking a thousand sales calls with like one specific type of person. So like with the, you just said like location can change it, but like generally speaking, you're selling to people with master's degrees. Like how does that, how does that vary? Uh, in terms of their, yeah. Yeah. Like I guess how you, you're probably really good at selling to that type of person by now, but like, do you, do you see that, you know, it always boils down to like the same things for these people or like, you know, I'm just curious to know your experience selling to like the same people for so long. Yeah. I mean, you, you tend to get really good at like speaking the language of like what, how people talk and like knowing kind of like the strings to pull, but like, it's also like legitimately the stuff they all go through. They have like a lot of them are very much more introverted and they like to give more than them to receive. Um, and are really bad with money and business mindset and are more right brain than left brain. And so it's like just bringing some of the other side and like, I hear you and but what about this side? I think I've gotten really good just like being really quick at uh, talking through that stuff. But like, I think someone else coming in, and I've had sales people do that, can watch 50 of my sales calls and they get a lot of that language pretty quickly. Um, just kind of modeling it. Um, so I don't know, it's, I guess, I don't know if that answers the question, but like, yeah, yeah, you get really good at talking to yeah, like this specific person. Are our therapists like general? Well, maybe your, you know, your experience is limited because you haven't like sold all these different types of people. But like, do you find therapists to be generally like difficult people to sell to? Um, difficult in that like they're very emotional process oriented. And so I've had trouble before using sometimes tactics that might work in other industries. Yeah. It feels like because you almost have to take a softer approach. I think, yeah. I think I've, I've probably landed on my face a lot. People like, I just didn't like the way that sat with me. And it's like, okay, like, cause that, that wouldn't work. That's not how I would sell something yeah. to me, you know? Yeah. When, with what I'm selling now, or like, so sell manager now, but like, up until now closing for them and all the sales training, like all we joke about it, but it's so true. Like all your problems on these sales calls are by you not controlling the frame because we're selling to like entrepreneurs and you know, people who they get it right. And they're not here to waste time. And they're like, just to the point. So it's like, it's not even, yes, it's about the knowledge of the product and the service, and understanding their business, but like so much of it just comes down to the perception that you are the guy, yeah. you know, which is different. Cause like when I sold fitness, it was very emotional. You know, you're having to convince people 
who don't take action to take action in like a one call close model. So we definitely have a lot. I mean, of that like expert frame dynamics and super important expert frame. Yeah, it's like it, it's it's also like there's a reason we have the content. If people don't show up to the like, that's what I'm doing that time for a while. Like, if they don't watch like, the videos, I'm not having a call with them. And it's like, and it's truly, it truly is a waste of my time. Like, I'm not, I'm not making that. Up. Like, it is a waste of my time yeah. to sell to someone who's like cold. Who are you? Why should I get like? I'm sorry, no, go watch the videos and if yeah. you don't want to go to the next call, that's fine. But like, um, that's an important piece and it does carry through. It's like, you're the one with the problem. I have the solution and I, you know, and if you want to solve your problem, great. If not, great. But like, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I don't have to try and convince you to solve your problem. You have to convince me why it's actually important enough to change. Like, yeah. that sales guy on Twitter is uh, fantastic. With all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, his stuff is like, it, I think it depends what you sell because on you know a lot of people who might be watching this, they might be like younger or trying to get into sales and stuff like that. So his stuff like we might go over their head, but like when you're selling to professionals, it's 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 hard to teach, man. Like you just need reps. Yeah. Like you take you gotta have the sauce. You can't yeah, you can't just like when you hire a new sales rep. You can't just like say, oh, do this, do this, do this. It's just like, just watch my calls, you know? And sometimes they can pick it up, sometimes they can't. But you said, uh, and I guess this would be a relevant topic. You said you like recently hired a new sales guy, right? Yeah. Um, like I started bringing on a new guy. I've done a bunch of interviews with people, throwing some people on calls. But like slowly bring on a new guy who's also another offer, but like trying to phase him into like almost ramping up and then eventually going full time. And then I also had my one of my setters close his first call this week. Okay. Um, so I now have I can close, and I have three people who have closed who can close, and I want to start to ramp basically the both of them up, ramp me off of calls. Uh, it's a it's a bit of it's been a tough thing like getting yeah. sales guys on board that can perform consistently. It's been a tough thing. It's like, it's a balancing act, right? Yeah. Between a, a lot of things. It's like the ads, well, I don't know, like with the co beautiful thing about coaching model, like you don't really have a fulfillment bottleneck as much, but like, I know yours is more like, it is some done for you. Yeah. Do you guys want into that? A bit. We have of like a, can we get the websites? Can we actually build out all the stuff for people? Do we have enough space on the coaching, on the coaches calendars? Mm -hmm. But we've, moved less towards just one-on-one -on -one, towards like small group, which is, I mean, that fixes the bottom like, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, man. Sales people, I mean, I'm, I'm actually getting to the point for the first time ever where I'm on the other side of the interview. Like I've always been the sales guy getting interviewed. And then just this week I'm hiring a couple of people for the company I'm managing. And then I'm hiring a person for myself because I'm like, can't do it all. So I'm learning how to interview and I'm, I asked you earlier about like the timing piece and I kind of, I kind of figure, man, it's like, there's really no right answer. Yeah. It's just like, try if it doesn't work, fix whatever happened, try again. Yeah. And then eventually you just break through and that's, that's entrepreneurship, bro. Like, yeah. I think it's kind of, is. it's like, well, what do you want? Okay. You want this thing? Well, what do you feel like is the best way to get there? Okay. Go try that. Yeah. You just have to and do it. What's like, interesting. I, you know, I heard this, you know, I mean, this 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 mastermind is a lot like multi millionaire, uh, multi million, and you know uh, eight figure businesses like some of them, and one of the people who's like leads it is like it's the same thing like for employees. Like, if you want to teach employees to take responsibility, they come to you with a problem. You say, well, what do you think the solution is? Or well, maybe this. Like, okay, go try that. And you don't try and like solve it for them. Like you have to for everyone. It's like a you can do the research on like what the best principles are within the marketplace you can find experts to guide you but like you gotta go try the thing yourself mm -hmm. and see what happens you know and like yeah. back yourself yeah yeah i think there's i think there's a whole level to this that like i haven't explored yet and i know i will soon but like like managing employees how to be like good boss when to hire all that stuff and then we were talking earlier i was like i'm thinking about things that i haven't thought about before mm -hmm. like seeing from from the or like looking down at the operation and like how you're going to grow it out. So I'm 
it's a refreshing conversation. I'm gonna mm-hmm. I'm gonna leave and go work on my computer. <laughs> Great yeah. Friday night. Yeah, out Friday some, night. Let's catch up some stuff on uh, on Canva. Use yeah. Lucid. Lucid. Uh, there's a lot of like these little like almost you put these little pieces together. I've been liking to play with those things. Put pieces together. What do you mean? Like, like you, I've been doing it for like some of the therapists I'm working with. Like, okay, if you hired three people. How much profit does this person bring? Okay, I mean, like, what are the costs over here? And I like, put like label it with like shapes and stuff. Mm-hmm. And you have like this this kind of picture of what what the business they want to create looks like. Okay. And then they can go higher towards that, you know, and start putting yeah. pieces together. I've been using the that like whiteboard thing. It's like Miro. Miro. Mm-hmm. What, do you know what it's called? I don't know. There's a lot more orange things. Yeah. I don't know, dude. I, I like. I know. I I want to use that, but I just can't like. I feel like I can't truly express what I what I want to express yeah. on that. So, uh, kind of random topic there, but dude, I'm getting I'm getting hungry. Yeah, me <laughs> so too. I think we're dinner time. <laughs> I think it's I think it's about that time. So, hopefully, we've got a good recording. If you guys made it this far, it might switch from one camera to another. The audio might be in, it might be out. I don't know. We ha- we'll get it together one way or another. Um, yeah. But yeah, so anyone who wants to follow you, where do you want to send them? You can go to my Instagram, Griffin Malice. You can go to my Twitter, Griffin Malice. I got like 100 followers there. Um, but Instagram is probably the one I'm going to start building up. I'll start watching YouTube videos, but it's going to be more targeted towards therapists. If you're a therapist in private practice, looking to grow, go to buildyourpractice.net, book, uh, book a call. Let's go. Help you out. Yeah, all that stuff is going to be linked in the description. Um, and then also, uh, just cool to document, tomorrow is our Lone Star Sales Summit, first one. You're gonna be there. Um, There's gonna be a lot of people there, so should be a good time. This one, this video's not gonna go out until yeah. a week or two after, but yeah, should be fun, man. And Austin's fun, and it, I'm glad we were able to, I'm glad you invited me to lunch or dinner that one time, yeah. and then now we're, we're here and just meeting, meeting the right people so it's been it's been cool recording this throughout the technical difficulties and the sun break and all that stuff but i think this is a long one too it is yeah, like I think this is a good one it's like an hour <laughs> and a half at least an hour and a half maybe hour 45 might be the longest one yet yeah um but yeah i guess we'll wrap it here appreciate it appreciate you having me on for sure all right <laughs> <laughs>